Continuing with chapter 27, Magnetic Fields and Magnetic Forces. Tonight we're going to look at the contrast uh, between magnetic fields and electric fields. There are a lot of similarities, but we should look at both those and the differences. Um, we're going to analyze the motion of a particle in a magnetic field. We already looked at the force on it, but there are some implications to the force always being perpendicular to the motion that affects its, its uh, motion. It'll give you a very distinct and special type of motion. <coughs> But first, let's talk flux again. Flux is a cool word. Um, so we're going to define magnetic flux through a surface in just the same way that we defined electric flux. There are field lines. They're not actually moving, but they are pointing sort of everywhere. Or everywhere in space you have a magnetic field that is pointing in some direction with some magnitude. Possibly zero, though, so I guess that statement's not true. Um, but once again, we're looking for... Um, the cosine of the angle between dA and the magnetic field at every point. And dA, remember, is um, perpendicular to the surface, to the flat surface. If you go close enough to any shape, zoom in, it'll look flat locally. And so the angle between B and A and dA there. The magnetic flux through any closed surface is zero. If you remember Gauss's law said the magnetic flux through a surface was equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. But for a magnetic field, it's always zero. This is a direct consequence of there being no magnetic monopoles. You've always got to have a north and south pole. So anything, um, any magnetic field leaving your Gaussian surface has to come back in somewhere. Or, um, and so even if there's a source of magnetic field in there, it's got to come back to it again. Um, we've got to loop around. So rather than being sort of radially outward, magnetic fields are loopy. <coughs> pardon the expression. And they... Um, so your, your flux enclosed is always zero. Unfortunately, this makes it not as useful as Gauss's law. Gauss's law, what we could use to actually find out what the electric field is, and for this, we don't get to use it very often. It's not a terribly useful piece of information um, because, because it's sort of that zero sort of cuts out all the useful information. So if it's good to know, and we're definitely going to need to know it, um, and it's not useless, it's just not as useful as Gauss's law. So it doesn't matter what the shape enclosed or what's inside, whether or not there's a magnetic field inside, the flux is going to be zero every time. So the flux is the integral of B dot dA, the magnetic flux through a surface that always equals zero. Should have put that right on there, actually, just equals zero every time. There it is. All right, through any surface, that was it, I guess. So the, so the difference between this, this is the flux through a surface, this is the flux through a closed surface. So you can get flux through, let's see if you just have like a pane of area, like a piece of paper. You can get flux through a piece of paper. But if it is a closed surface in three dimensions, it's a shape that has uh, that encloses something, say, this bottle, right? It's, it's closed and there's no holes in the shape itself. Then the flux enclosed there is always zero. So that little symbol there around your integral sign means it's a closed loop around dA. So here's a shape that isn't enclosed. It's just a piece of area. So you can have some flux that isn't zero. You've got a B and you've got an A. And the angle between them in this case is, um, uh, looks like 60 degrees, right? Because dA is perpendicular to that surface. And this that 30 degrees was to like the table or something. Um, Okay, so now when you put a particle in a magnetic field, if it is not moving, nothing happens. If it is moving, it feels a force. Let's say it's not in an electric field, it's just in a magnetic field, a particle all by itself. So the only force it feels is the magnetic force, right? It feels a constant, if it has a constant speed, whatever speed it has at the beginning stays the same. Magnetic fields don't do any work. Because the force is always 90 degrees to that, it can't speed it up or slow it down. It can only change the direction of it. And since the direction is changing, the magnetic force is always changing because it's always perpendicular to both. So that results in a circular path every time, unless some other force acts on it, which could change that. But if it's just that force, it is going in a circle the whole time. And, if, and any object that moves in a circle, remember, remember its acceleration is v squared over r. Right? So if you take the force F equals ma, you get the force is QVB sine theta. Um, and if the, I guess the, I guess in this case, specifically the, um, the velocity and the magnetic field had to be 90 degrees to each other. Uh, we'll look at the case when that isn't true in a minute. QVB sine theta equals mv squared over r, do a little math, 
you get the radius of this circle. All right, so if, if the B and V are perpendicular to each, to each other, the force will always be pointed towards the center of a circular path of motion. Um, and this is a very convenient thing to do. Um, so the uh, revolutions per unit time are called the cyclotron frequency, which you could figure out uh, once you know the radius of that circle and the velocity of the particle. You can figure out how many times per second it goes around. So, yeah, that's called cyclotron motion. Um, the cyclotron radius here, the radius of orbit of a particle in a magnetic field. Um, notice Q, you don't want to put a charge sign in there because it's always going to be, a, it'll just tell you whether it's going to go clockwise or counterclockwise. You're still going to use the right hand rule to determine whether it's going to go this way or that way. Right. Um, so if it's not perfectly perpendicular, then you've got two scenarios. The you can always break down the velocity into components that are perpendicular to the magnetic field and components that are parallel to it. The components that are parallel to it do not are not affected by the magnetic field, and so they will continue with that same amount, right? Neither speeding up nor slowed down nor turned, right? The the force on that part of its velocity is zero. The force on the other part of the velocity um, gives you that cyclotron motion. So you get a circle this way from all the parts that are perpendicular to the magnetic field give you a, a certain radius of a circle, which we just figured out. And then whatever it had that was parallel to the field, it keeps. And so you get this helical path. And you can split those two motions up and solve for the shape of that helical path, and you'll definitely have to do some of that. So the particle, the component that is parallel and perpendicular add up to give you this um, helical motion. The speed and the kinetic energy remain the same in both cases. For the part that is parallel to the magnetic field, it doesn't have any effect. There's no force. For the part that is perpendicular, it feels only a force that is perpendicular that can only change its direction. It can't speed it up or slow it down. So under no circumstances does the magnetic field do any work on the particle. Under no circumstances does it change the particle's velocity. Now you might throw a magnetic, uh, an electric field in there, which can change the, the speed. And we're going to do that later. We're going to put the two together, but not just yet. <clears throat> so, um, if your magnetic field isn't uniform, um, then you can get all kinds of funky situations where the, the, sh the shape of the path changes. Um, as the magnetic field gets stronger or weaker, the radius of that path might change. Um, as it changes direction, you can change the direction of the particle. And so we use this math to direct particles. We send them through um, particle accelerators based entirely on these, this idea of a magnetic bottle where we contain the shapes. Or the modern um, fusion reactors that are on the, on the horizon are all about keeping ionized particles inside uh, a magnetic bottle inside a magnetic field of a very specific shape. The same thing happens with the Earth's magnetic field, which is kind of loopy around the sides. All of the particles coming from the sun, which are protons and electrons and have charges, are deflected either northward or southward, depending on their velocity um, trajectories. And so they, they'll they loop around um, in helical paths until they slam into our atmosphere and create the aurora borealis in the north and the aurora Austra australialis in the south, aurora australialis. Good one. Um, those are called the Van Allen radiation belts, so when you make these particles move in a helical path, um, you generate some radiation when they slam into things. <clears throat>